mix up the desert and it's going to give you some wonderful wits. Oh, wow. Yes. 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 Hello, everyone. No Thank you for coming out in this heat. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Dr. David. I'm also a chiropractor. Um, I also do a bunch of other stuff as well. I do biochemistry and I do a bit of writing as well. So Jen asked me to be here tonight to talk about wellness. So it's pretty broad. So what I love is if, as I'm talking, if anyone's got any ideas, questions, just raise your hand and we'll, I'll do my best to answer them, yeah? So I think it's good to have people give me what you're thinking rather than me just going off on a tangent that no one's interested in. Bring me back to centre by asking a question you're actually interested in. Alright? So any time raise your hand. Alright, so we're going to talk about wellness, which is a, like I said, it's a broad area. Before you even talk about something, we have to sort of define it. So does anyone have a definition for wellness? Anyone know what it is? Just simply or a long description or a brief description? Being healthy. Healthy. Comfortable? No, it's not. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm just yeah. saying it's the whole body, mind, and spirit. Body, mind, spirit, okay. Anyone agree or disagree with that? I like body, mind, spirit. I don't use body, mind, spirit too much though, because the word spirit has religious connotations, and whether that's a good or a bad thing, it's irrelevant, but people have a slant on it. So I like to use body, mind, consciousness, which is the same thing but it's just a little bit more scientific and we can define it a little bit better. So, I like the definition of body, mind, consciousness, and those three things together create wholeness. So wellness is wholeness, it's the same thing, it's a synonym for the same thing. So if you have integration of all three things, you have wholeness, which is wellness. So many techniques will try and give you the best they have at one particular area. So perhaps it's all body. Like fitness is all body. It's not all, but that's pretty much the mechanism of what they do. It's all body. Mind is the traditionally the realm of psychiatry, psychology, self-help literature, etc. Yeah, and that's pretty broad as well. And spirit is traditionally religion, the ancient Buddhist traditions, and consciousness. Again, we'll talk about later. That kind of covers that whole banner. So wholeness. That's my definition of wholeness. Is wholeness. So when you integrate the parts, you get the whole. Policy. Same thing. Yeah. A lot of these things are synonyms. So just a quick little bit about me. Uh, like I said, I'm a chiropractor. I had somewhat of a fantasy when I first came out of college. I thought, yep, yeah, I've got this one tool to cure the world. And I left chiropractic school thinking, yep, yeah, this is gonna it's gonna be magic. Could you hear stories of people curing this and that and just creating miracles essentially? So well, this is fantastic, and we cure the world. Within about six months, I got humbled pretty quickly because you don't know, cure everyone. You fix a lot of stuff, you don't fix everything. So that kind of led me down another path, and I ended up studying biochemistry, which we use a natural method of biochemical testing and implementing solutions there. So through those two things, I then had the body and the chemistry, which is part of the body as well. So you've got the structure and the chemistry. So I have those two things mastered. And with that, you can fix a lot of stuff. So the chemistry is traditionally drugs and medicine, those kind of things. So a drug is fixing the chemistry. Well, it's blocking the chemistry, but it's trying to affect it. So a panadol is trying to stop pain. That's a chemical scenario. And it does pretty well at doing that. Like neurofin stops inflammation, prostaglandin inflammation. So that's a chemical effect. And like I said, if you want to go back to the structure and do something with that, exercise, for example, is going to boost your structure. It's going to get you a high there. The natural way to affect the chemistry is through nutrition. So if you can master your nutrition, you've mastered the chemical side of the body. Uh, that's what we do with biochemistry, is we test various things and get the hormones right. So that's what we do there. But pretty soon, with those two modalities, I still hadn't solved everything and everyone wasn't cured. So I went on another journey and I found consciousness. And through that, you pretty much got it under wraps. You're still not going to fix everyone or cure everyone, but you pretty much got the whole pattern. You can see that there is nothing else. There is consciousness, there is body, and there is mind, or the emotions. And with that, you now have the tools to affect any change, whether you actually do that or not, in another question, you now have the tools to complete the whole. So with that, I went on a journey, and that's what I've been doing since. Um, yeah. There's 
a lovely quote here, and it says, All illness are physical, mental, and spiritual, and the highest levels of recovery are the consequence of simultaneously addressing all three and seeing them as being equal importance. So rather than just taking one aspect and saying, I'm going to focus on this to get me healthy, I'm going to use just drugs, or I'm going to use just nutrition, or I'm going to use just exercise, or I'm going to use just chiropractic, a lot of people do that. They take one road and they think, this is my thing. Like, okay, I'm going to go off gluten and I'm going to be healthy forever. Or whatever their little thing is. Or I'm going to do interval training and that's going to be my saving grace. And that may be true in part, but it doesn't accomplish the whole picture. So I'm going to repeat it again and I'm going to say it many times. When you get the parts together, whatever they are for you, you create wholeness. And that's wellness. So for most people, the question now becomes, what is it that I'm missing in my triangle? of health or wellness? What am I lacking to get me up to that next level? Is it something in consciousness? Have I got a resentment or an anger or a grief or a shame or something going on in mind that is affecting the other two areas? Is something in consciousness affecting the structure? And that kind of thing, yeah? Resonating with you? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I love that one. I love that one. <laughs> I'm just going to throw words out. I'll probably affect something. So resentment, mm. right? Um, that's a huge one, by the way. Yeah, or anger, and it's yeah. kind of linked in. Yeah. So, I'll give you a, a concrete example of what I actually mean by this, rather than theory. Let's give a real hard example. So, like I said, we work in a wellness practice, so we see this every day. We see people coming in that have, I got a sore knee, or I got a sore back, or I got a sore head, whatever it is. Fix me, please. And, they, and I say, well, how did you get it? Where did it come from? And they say, I mm. okay, got slept wrong. Okay. You've been sleeping for how long? Um, 41. So you've been for 41 years and you stuffed it up last night? <laughs> I don't think so. Unless your bed is completely stuffed or you... It just doesn't happen, right? That, it does actually happen, but it's quite rare. Yeah, did you fall out of bed? <laughs> so generally, they say, oh, I don't know, I came from somewhere, I woke up with it. Generally, that's going to be coming from the chemical system or something in consciousness, something in mind, something with the emotions that has been slowly dribbling down and then eventually it became a structural issue. So you've got the headache or the back pain or the knee pain, whatever it might be. So for example, this morning, I saw a young lad who had knee pain. And it was a classic thing, I don't know, it's just been getting progressively worse over the last two weeks. Bilateral knee pain, both knees in the front. And there's been some history of knee issues with this guy before, but it was particularly bad this time, and it was really out of the blue. No idea where it came from. I said, all right, so what did you do? No, no idea. Have you been doing any different exercise? That's all the question. Nothing. Okay. What else is going on right now? Um, well, I'm planning for my wedding, and I'm just trying to organise cars, and my job is really stressful because my boss wants these three projects done, and, and all these things in mind were going on. I said, okay, that's fine. So we, we got him up on the table and did a few tests, and there were some weaknesses through the leg muscles that support the knee. All right, that's a start. We've got some weaknesses there. So the knee joint is being supported on both sides. If you understand a little bit about the way that works, what I knew that those particular muscles are related to the adrenal glands. And the adrenal glands are your stress handling glands. So if you're overstressed, <laughs> if you're overstressed the adrenals eventually get exhausted. And when they get exhausted, the muscles related to them get weak. And that weakness now gives you instability in the knee and potentially, not always, but potentially knee pain. And that's what this guy had. So we did a few other things and we worked out that he was deficient in the vitamins and minerals that recharge the adrenal glands. So that was the therapy, knee pain goes away. And that was today, so I don't know if it's worked yet, but I've seen that a hundred times. So I know that it's going to work within a few days. Those nutrients will boost the adrenal glands, pain will go away. Now that's not the solution. That's better than a drug because at least you're giving the body what it needs rather than blocking it. Stress is the cause, not the, the deficiency in the vitamins. That was the end result. But that's the best we could do. We didn't have an hour to talk about what was going on with stress. Um, there's many, many things you can do to do that. <laughs> Perhaps we should talk later. <laughs> example of how the mind then creates a chemical change which creates an organic change which creates a structural pain. Now that's the majority of what really people are walking around with. Now chiropractic is a wonderful tool 
to adjust the spine and adjust things to get them moving better, to allow the nervous system to function better, which heightens the flow of everything. So that's why I love chiropractic, because you can help a lot of people just with that simple tool. Um, and oftentimes it is actually the cause. Sometimes it's just you've got a stressful physical job, you sit too much or you're a trade person and your shoulder hurts or your knee hurts because of physicality. So absolutely, that's a really good solution in those cases. Uh, the majority of the time when you don't know what's happened though, it's consciousness, chemical, structure, uh, knee hurts, usually in that flow. When talking about what people think about with disease and ill health or lack of wellness, generally what people do is they put the power of that illness outside themselves. They say, oh, sleeping caused it, or my boss is a jerk, he caused it, um, or I tripped over and that caused it, or etc., etc. The government, I blame them, or whatever it is, whatever the cause outside of myself is, really, that's the victim mentality. When you take the power back, but it comes from within, you heal much faster. Not many people do that. The people that do, they heal really quickly. And some people spontaneously, they'll get a pain and then poof, it's gone straight away because they own it. They don't project it onto someone else and say you're the cause or this is the cause of my pain. When you deny pain, it hangs around. What you resist persists, as Carl Jung said, who's a psychologist. So where does healing actually come from then? Does it come from the nutrition or the drug or the surgery? or the adjustment in the terms of chiropractors, or the, the massage, or the acupuncture needle. Is that where it actually comes from? Is that where the power is? No, it's in the mind. Is it in the mind? Yeah. Okay. What's, what, what is it more? Is it more the mind, or is it more something kind of behind the mind running the show? What, what would you call that? It's merely names for it. Spiritual. You can call it that. You can call it innate. Some people call it innate. Yeah. The intelligence of the body. Mm-hmm. Consciousness. Higher intelligence within. Yeah. yeah. Whatever you want to call it. But there's an intelligence of the body. Um, traditional scientists like to use the DNA as that. They say, what's the DNA? DNA controls everything. That's not true. DNA doesn't. DNA is a wonderful, really um, just beautifully designed piece of biological blueprint. That's what it is. It's, it's a set of blueprints in a biological form that prints out what the plans are on that, that paper, that biological paper. But what gets printed out is a matter of what is happening in the environment. So if I've got a blueprint for a house and I put it on the floor there, the house doesn't spontaneously build itself. Something has to come from the outside, like builders, architects, tradesmen, all of these different environmental conditions have to pick that up and plan and orchestrate and organise and build that thing. It doesn't happen spontaneously. It's the same with DNA. DNA sits there. It's inert. Until something from the environment, a signal comes along and says, I'll take that gene for insulin and I'll express that now. And I'll take that gene for amylase or for any of the genes that occur and I'll express that now. I'll take that gene for serotonin to make you normal. I'll take that gene for dopamine to give you pleasure. I'll now take that gene for serotonin and give you too much of it and make you anxious. Or I'll make not enough of it and make you sad. But that signal still came from the outside, with some exceptions. Broken DNA does actually exist. But by and large, 99% of it, DNA is normal, and it's the environment that has the effect. So genes have got this really uh, glorified role in medicine and in science these days, which is unjustified. They're a fantastic blueprint, but it's the environment that affects it. I'll give you some examples. Um, back in the early 1900s, when psychoanalysts were first working out what it was, what the mind actually was, they were trying to define it. They were seeing patients and, and curing them of certain things, and some they didn't cure. There's a wonderful story of a psychoanalyst in the early 1900s. He had this patient who had a few mental conditions, but she was relatively sane. She was a normal person, had a few issues. And he knew that she was violently allergic to red roses. So for years he was treating her. And one day he had an absence of mind and he got some roses and put them in the waiting room. And she came in furious, saw the roses there, started sneezing and all this stuff and started getting watery. And he brought her in and he's, uh, she's berating him. saying, what are you doing? You know I'm allergic to roses. How could you do that? That's so stupid. And he said, well, they're paper roses. 
and she sort of had this response that she just now realised that all of that was what's called a premature cognitive um, commitment. Right? Premature, premature cognitive commitment. So she decided, because she's allergic to roses, she saw them, and all of that stuff got expressed in her genes. All of the very real running of the eyes and the sneezing and all of those real chemical reactions occurred from what she believed. It was belief. It wasn't true, though. Because there were no roses in the room. It was all from her mind. And they've done a whole lot of uh, experiments with humans and a lot with animals, too. There's some really funny ones um, with mice. They did this one in the 1980s. So this has been around a long time. It's not like this is all new and new age stuff. It's been a long time. So and they do it on humans. These are on animals, these ones. So mice. Uh, two groups of mice. And this group over here, uh, we're going to smell camphor, which is just a, a very powerful smell. And this group over here, we're also going to smell camphor. But as these guys over here smelt the camphor, they got injected with a very powerful immunosuppressant. And these guys, when they sit on camphor, they got injected with a very powerful immuno booster. So one suppressant, one booster, smelling the same thing. And after a period of time, they stopped injecting them, and they just gave them the smell. And surprise, surprise, the immuno, the immune cells either dropped or broke, just by the smell, because the brain had linked them and said, every time I smell that, that equals this. And humans do the exact same thing. We're creatures of habit. That's the way our brains are organised. And the way they're organised like that is for survival. We all wouldn't be here today if our ancestors weren't really good at surviving. So we've all got brains wired for perfect survival. If we didn't, we wouldn't be here. Quite simple. But they're so good that they link and associate everything with everything, especially if you repeat it more than a few times. So, you see roses, you get a violent reaction because that's what you're used to and you've made that link. For example, the other one with humans is fascinating. They had a group of premature babies, they're called primates. Two groups. And um, I'm not sure how premature they were, but they were all very closely matched. And this was a study at a university hospital. And one group of premature babies over here, another group over here. And the ones over here got their formula and their different things they needed on a schedule. You know, at 6 a.m. they got this, and then at 8 a.m. they got this, and it was exactly the same as what these guys got. The only difference between the two groups, same technicians, so they kept it as clean as they could. These guys were picked up out of their crib for 10 minutes and stroked. Okay, they called it kinesthetic tactile stimulation. Love, right? They were hugging them and kissing them and stuff like that, but they had to keep it very clinical and call it kinesthetic tactile stimulation. And the conclusion from that whole experience was that these guys over here that got the tactile stimulation, they got stroked, they gained weight 47%, they had 47% more weight per day just by love. What's that? They were more content. Yeah. We can't even define what it is that they were getting, exactly how that works. We don't really know how exactly that works. We do know that when you do that, you can see measurable changes in the growth hormone and all these different things that are life-giving. So those babies who got the love gained more weight. And the conclusion from the article from the authors was that tactile kinesthetic stimulation is a cost-effective way to treat babies. Not love helps humans <laughs> or something as unscientific as that, just that it saves money. So that was the conclusion. But you get the point that the environment dictates what's expressed. So same babies, one got love and one grew, one didn't. Well, it's a group. Well, I'm in that same situation, actually. I'm happy and content now and I've put a lot of weight back on. When I was going at my stress time, I had dropped a lot to the stage where I was getting dangerously low. Right, so and unhealthy. And of course, so I went to the doctor and she said, no, you need to lose weight now because obviously I've put so much on, but I've associated with being happy with putting the weight on. Right. Which is a correct association or an incorrect? Well, correct to a degree, but there's a dangerous level to it as well. Because so it's a spectrum, I'm, isn't it? Yeah, it's not, it's not and I haven't got the boundary to where it needs to be. I've just let it keep going. Okay. Now it's getting to the stage where I have to, I have to do something about it. It doesn't mean that I still can't be content, but I have to change something myself. The first step is awareness to that. Yeah. And bringing that forward and bringing it to your conscious awareness and yeah. saying, okay, what is 
wrong, if you want to define it as wrong, yeah. or what can I do to improve it? And yeah, that's what I've looked at. It doesn't mean that I can't still be happy. It just means I have to change what, whether it be eating, as you said, eating, fitness, um, exercise, all that type of stuff. Don't push that to the side and go, no, this is where I need to be. Bring those back in to that triangle again. Link, which is what you're talking. Link healthy habits to a healthy way rather than yes. love to yep. perhaps not so a healthy way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Change the link. If you don't change the association, which is a very strong association, by the way, it takes a lot of repetition to break it. Yep. Or you can let it go in a moment. But we'll talk about that in a second. There's um, another really good example that they've done in the United States about a cytokine, which is just a body chemical to do with the immune system, called interleukin-2. Interleukin-2 is a immune modulating hormone that tells the body there are either cancer, virus, bacteria, or fungus present, and to mobilize cells necessary to kill it, to get rid of it, to flush it out. So interleukin-2 is a really important, naturally body-made chemical that does that. But if you were to buy that as a drug from the hospital, it's $80,000 per dose. You make it millions of dollars worth of it silently without even realizing every time you get cold. And every moment when a cancer cell pops up, an interleukin 2 comes along and kills it. And that's happening right now in all of us silently. When it goes wrong, they give you $80,000 worth of this injection, and then again, and again, and again. But you make it for free if your body is functioning perfectly, or at least well. And you can increase the amount of interleukin 2 and all the whole gamut of other positive emotion hormones just by having a correct interpretation of event. Now that's the key, it's the interpretation, it's not the event itself. I could give you a hug and you could produce <laughs> cortisol and adrenaline and substance P and prostaglandins and be in a lot of pain and be on the floor crying and run out of here. I've had that happen. <laughs> or if your interpretation of the hug is nice, you might produce some solution to dopamine and oxytocin and a whole raft of positive chemicals, but it's not the event itself. It's the interpretation of the event. So it depends on the value of the nightclub having it. That's right. Yeah. Creepy guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's creepy guy. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm well. So, yeah, it's, 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 it's probably a good thing. <laughs> so, it's the interpretation of the event. All events in life are actually neutral. And this is what all the ancient religions were trying to tell us in very obscure and hard to understand language and very mystical language, but all events are neutral. They're, nothing is black and white, it's just our projection that we put on it, our labels we put on it. And how we label it is based on our values, what we hold to be important in life. So if I've got, if I'm walking through life and I've got a value on fitness and health and money, right, I'll walk down the street with my friend and we both see a lady coming up towards us. And I see the fact that she's wearing Lorna Jane and that she's really fit. She probably looks like she's a triathlete. Just by the way her legs are and she's actually carrying a bike along with her. So she's probably a triathlete. And I, because I'm interested in money as well, I see that she's got some very nice stuff and she must do well. And she's probably a professional because she's getting sponsored to be able to afford all that. That's what I see. My friend who likes property and comic books sees the fact that she doesn't have the body of a comic book lady and comic book people don't ride bikes and I'm bored by that once over here. Right, so it's, we saw the exact same thing but our values or what we held to be important directed us in a different direction and we started thinking different things. Uh, I just made that up by the way, that's not interested in fitness now. <laughs> um, so it's the interpretation of the event, everything is neutral. And people say, well that's not true because what about terrible events like rape or murder or torture or war, etc. How can that be neutral? Well, how much time you got? Because the more deeply you look into each of those things, you see that some people have seen them as a benefit. Some people got something out of it. Someone won out of that thing. Perhaps 40 million people died in World War II. But what else happened from that? There's positives somewhere. Perhaps a whole bunch of people lost their homes and their jobs and their careers in the global financial crisis. But now Australia is saving more money than ever. 
So some people are winning out of it, and it's created more intelligence about what to do with money. For example, after the mass shootings in Tasmania, in Australia in the 90s, guns got banned. So there's always a blessing, but people don't see it immediately. The media sensation things and says this is negative. My mother, who I think is very nice, she always says, that say, when, for example, see, so sorry, the map I used while I was there, we had to have probably uh, the amputations and um, because of the poverty. And I was saying, how oh, terrible this could happen, this is a guy, but it's really peace, you know, being in the bed, this guy up. She said to me, stuff like that happens to people and his attitude and how positive his attitude to it has been is inspirational. That happens to kind of wake the rest of us up and you have to have these things happen so that the rest of us can wake. Okay, my life's not so bad. I can, if he can be positive about what he's facing, then the fact that I've had a great day today. Mm. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. And it's infinitely yeah. positive. Yeah, it is. Because it's, and it's actually not positive, it's just neutral. Because it's still both sides. Because someone, regardless of the spin you put on it, or your mum puts on it, someone still goes, no, it's negative. And they see it that way, and other people see it as only positive. So really, it actually balances out. It is actually still neutral, because it's still a label you're putting on it. It's, it's neutral. Or empty, as the Buddhists would say. That challenges a lot of people's beliefs. It's like, no, 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 losing your arms is not positive. Uh, no, that's, that's great. It's a trauma. It's no good. And other people say, no, no, it's a lesson. And people deny that still. So I still think it's neutral. Mm-hmm. But it's the spin you put on. It's the interpretation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he could he could go and make the most fantastic life for himself and inspire people. Yeah, and I think that's the purpose it serves in the end. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that goes back to neurology as well. Is literally making your mind up is quite challenging. Change is very hard for the brain. It's very, very difficult. Because the way we've thought for our lives is the pattern that the brain spits out. That's reaction. Reactivity rather than conscious awareness is the norm. And that's that survival mechanism I was talking about. The brain naturally just goes to what it's done because it thinks it's served you so far. So if something comes up that you've always thought negatively about, you're always going to think negatively about it. And to change your mind, you've literally got to rewire the brain, which is absolutely possible. We now know that for sure with neuroplasticity, absolutely. But it takes a bit of effort because you've got to repeat the new stuff. So you don't just change your mind one day and go, yep, everything's positive now. It doesn't work like that. People try that. They read books and go, yeah, this is going to happen. This is going to do it. The classic example is exercise, fitness. People do this every time around January. When they've eaten too much and drunk too much, they go, all right, stop this. I'm overweight and I feel crap and I'm unfit and that's it. I've had enough. I'm going to change starting today. So January 1st, they go on the internet and they look up the gyms or they look up a boot camp or they work something out and they go and join. And within a week or two weeks or a couple of months if they're lucky, they're back to where they were before or worse, sometimes worse, because they now feel guilty that they didn't stick to what they said they would. They couldn't focus on this new goal. Why is that? Part of it is neurological. The old habit is there. The other really important thing that people miss out on, they blame the brain a lot. They're like, ah, oh, the brain's hard to change. It's the brain's fault. You've got to repeat it and do that. Well, it is the brain, but we're blessed with the brain because it's here to serve us if you know how it works. So to use the gym example again, I used to work at a gym when I was going through school. And every year in January, we saw that. We saw our, our club swell from 2,000 members up to 2,100, 2,200, whatever. It would just there'd be a whole bunch, a whole glut of new members. But the first couple of weeks, there are a few people, and then they die away. So I got wondering what was actually happening here. Why are people joining and then dropping out? And then picking themselves up, feeling guilty, and being worse off. Well, it comes down to those values again that I was talking about before. Whatever you place importance on is what you do. So if I find the gym important to me and fitness important to me, I just do it. I'm inspired by it, I love doing it. No one has to remind me to do it. If it's a new value of mine because I've seen myself feel like crap and I've seen other people getting fit and I've now decided I want to change, that's an objective value. It's not my true value, so it's a temporary shift. So I go and join the gym, but I'm still actually living out my life according to what's really important to me. 
I'm still going to work, I'm still doing the other things that are actually important. Well, it starts saying, oh, I don't have time to go to the gym. Yeah. I don't have time to do this because yeah. it's not important to you. No, and that's when you require motivation. Okay. If you require motivation to do anything in life, it ain't important to you. And stop beating yourself up. Thank you. <laughs> Yes. And stop beating yourself up. Yeah, I'm doing it right from this minute. I ain't yeah. doing it no more. Don't do it. Unless, unless you, you can actually change your values by linking them to what actually is important to you. So let's say I'm really overweight and I'm unfit and I've just got a medical checkup that says my triglycerides are through the roof and I can barely walk upstairs without puffing and panting and I'm close to a heart attack. And I've just got a wake up call. And I'm not interested in exercise, never have been. It's not one of my values. I don't do it, right? I'm not inspired by it. I require motivation to do it. How do I become? How do I now get that to be part of my values? How do I actually wake up and go, gym today, love it? How do I do that? Has anyone got any ideas how you how, how you do you get those conditions in the first place? That's fear, though. That's using fear to scare you into it. It's using guilt and shame to but change. But you've had all those checks, like you obviously all those checks with doctors. So it's bad. Yep. You like you know said bad bad bad. So how what changed in your body and in your lifestyle for you then to have those results? So can you revert the re results by okay. just looking back to you know maybe what you lived four months ago? Maybe? Most of those people never lived healthy though. I've actually just no. gone through that now. I've been told yes, okay. I've obviously I'm too much weight and everything, and I've looked at it and gone, you know what? I have a lot to live. I have I have my life. I've, I'm just in a new relationship, I've got my daughter there, I've got my daughter back in my life, I've got so much to live for, so my motivation has changed to go, you know what, I don't want to be this person that can't do anything, I want to do something, so my motivation for me is to change what I've done, because yeah, otherwise, yeah, well, that's it, it's a stage life. Okay, so you just did exactly, you did the, that's the answer, yeah. that's the answer. And what that is, to explain that, to link it up to everyone else here so they can go, well, I don't, that doesn't make sense to me. How would I do that? What, what's your name? Leanne. What Leanne did that was beautiful is she didn't have the value for exercise. Hence I'll why you had to scare. I still don't have the value for exercise. Well, we'll, but... we'll, we'll talk about how to do that in a sec because you're close but you haven't done the whole yeah. thing yet. To get to that last bit, what you have to do is find out what actually is important to you, number one. If you don't know that, then none of this works. So you've got to actually work out what it is that, what inspires you. What do you wake up going, yep, I'm doing this today. What do you actually do that no one has to remind you to do? And it might be mundane things. It might be Facebook. It might be work. It might be chatting with your mum. It might be gardening. Whatever it is. They're your values. That's what's important to you. Don't deny them. Don't feel bad about having them. Don't look at the Joneses down the street and go, oh, they've got... $5 million in the bank and they've got such a good retirement and he's got such a good job and a good car, I should be doing that. Now, what your values are is what they are. Love yourself based on that. Don't deny them. That's who you are. And when you can accept that and actually say, these are my values, this is what I love, I'm inspired by these things because I do them every day. No one has to remind me to do them. Now you've got your list of what's actually truly inspiring to you. You now link the thing that you want to accomplish, exercise in this case, yeah. to those things. So as soon as you think of the gym, as soon as you wake up, you're thinking, when you think of the gym now, you don't think sweat and hard work. You think, my daughter, do you say do daughter? Yeah, my daughter? My daughter. My new, new relationship. New relationship. Do you say love, love to live. Like I want to live. live. You've probably got goals and stuff in the, in the future. Yeah, I do. I want to actually be able to travel and not be 75, 80 and go, oh, I can't do that travel because I'm so unfit or I can't move, I can't motivate. I want to be able to live a life and a full life, not just get, I mean, I'm 40, 41 this year, 42 this year. I don't want to get to 60 and go, you know what, I can't do any of this anymore because I've, I've put on too much weight, I've got no enthusiasm, I've got no energy, I've got nothing to live for. And I still have. Okay. I still have. So your highest values might be your daughter and your new relationship. Yeah. There's probably some other stuff in there as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's health. I know it's health because you're here tonight. Yeah. Yeah. All of you have got health in part as one of your values. It might be number five. It might be number one. Some of you might just love this stuff and you're all about it. But it might be down the list somewhere and you've just been somewhat motivated to come here tonight. But either way, it's somewhere in your list of values. Link what it is that you want to do to those things, the most inspiring things. You've got to make multiple links until as soon as you think of the gym, you're like, yeah, can't wait to do it. You don't need motivation anymore. You don't need personal training. Just do it. Yeah. Just get up, 6 a.m. and go. Or if morning's not your thing, you get up at 7. 
or do it in the afternoon or whatever it is. But it gets done because it's no longer, it's, it's now valid, it's now up on that list. So that's not easy to do. How many people do it? 1% of people do it. How many people are wealthy and successful? You can define wealth as financially independent and success as the fulfillment of all your deepest dreams and desires. Most people are living somewhat injective about these people. Like I said, they see other people who they infatuate with and think, I should have a bit of that, a bit of that. And they squash down their own values, beat themselves up for not living them, and still try and live out what's not really inspiring to them. And then you get guilt and shame because of that. And guilt and shame is a wreaks havoc on your immune system and your ability to heal. And just activates the stress response. And that's really what we're talking about tonight. Is the more out of sync you are with your true self, with what's actually inspiring to you, the further down the spiral you'll be from quick healing. You should heal from a, a virus or a bacteria in hours. It shouldn't be a week or ten days. You should heal from a back pain in hours after an adjustment. Or if you don't have the adjustment, even quicker than that if you've got all of this stuff lined up. Because you should be able to identify that thing in consciousness and let it go. And go and do what's inspiring to you. But your healing mechanisms are automatically highly tuned when you're living according to your values. So think of people in your life that are always happy. We all know these people. They're always happy. Pretty much always. They've got great jobs. I love what they do. They travel if they're inspired by that. Their families are great. They're never sick. Or if they are, very quick and it goes away quickly. And generally their bodies are in good shape. And they've got lots of friends and <laughs> the whole, everyone loves them in their family and stuff like that. Those people, if you look, they're doing what they love every day and they're not beating themselves up for not doing it. When they go to work, even if it's a menial job, if they're working at Woolies, they find the inspiration in being the checkout person. They chat with the people and they, they see specials and they're like, oh, isn't that great? Look at this new product. And they're just chatting with people and the whole thing's fantastic based on their interpretation of it. Because they're doing what they love. It doesn't matter what you do, it's your interpretation of it. So. You can't spell it, but all the back holes of self love is very detrimental for everybody. So, everybody who's featured, so when you start talking about self love, it's like talking some other alien language. Most people find it really hard yeah. to do that. They don't want to say I love you to themselves. No. And that's because of what we just said. Yeah. When you're in congruence with what's important to you, mm-hmm. truly in congruence, everything's integrated, you are doing day to day what inspires you, mm-hmm. you have self love. If you're not doing what you love, if you're living under a sense of shoulds and musts and have to, it's under objective values of other people you are beating yourself up yeah. in guilt and shame because you think you should be doing what they're doing which you're not. Yeah. So that's where self-worth comes from. Self-worth is doing whatever it is that inspires you to the best of your ability. That's the joy of existence, is doing whatever it is that you're doing to the best of your ability and being kind and loving to everyone unconditionally. That's the secret. There is nothing else. It's loving what it is right now and accepting it as it is. And that includes the negative. So when you stub your toe or you roll your ankle, it's not swearing at it and saying, oh, I want this pain to go away. It's going, yep, it's bleeds. And it goes away. This is, that's been around for as long as society has been around. It's called surrender. So if I roll my ankle and I deny it, and I go, oh, bloody ankle, it's swelling up, look at it. Oh, I'm limping now and I've got a swollen ankle and I've got to go to the car or the GP or whatever and get treatment on it. And I'm going to try and rub it and I'm going to try and make it heal. What I'm actually doing is trying to get it to go away. I'm not accepting it as it is. When you have complete and utter unconditional acceptance for everything as it is, perfectly as it is, that pain actually goes away. I challenge all of you to do that the next time you get any pain. It doesn't matter what it is. Do it. It takes a little bit of practice, but it happens quite quickly, within a few minutes. Um, and you get many opportunities to do it. Um, we all get little bo- bits and bobs of pain. We might just get a stiffness or something like that, or we'll fall over. Or, and the natural reaction straight away is to swear at it or, or whatever it is. I challenge you next time to just say, yes, yes. There it is. Uh, give me more, please. <laughs> don't, don't label it, though. Don't say, oh, that hip. Just go, up. Oh, yep. 
There it is. And feel it. Really feel it. And then just let it go. Don't push it away. Just, just let it go on its own terms. I did this the other day. Um, I walked outside and we've got some kind of rough steps outside and I misjudged the step and I um, hit my heel on the, the rough concrete thing and immediately cut it open and started bleeding. And I swore. <laughs> <laughs> you idiot, how clumsy are you? I'm relatively clumsy, so I started beating myself up for the idiot that I was in that moment, and I, my self-worth went right down. That's not how I conceptualise it, but I was calling myself a dickhead and all this kind of stuff. And, right? not, not really good self-worth at that time, and I, hang on a sec, what am I doing? Just let it go. So I sat down, and I looked at it, and I went, yep, there it is, it's bleeding, and I felt the throbbing, and I allowed that flap of skin to be there. Because it was. What are you going to do? Are you going to sew it up? It was there, sorry. <laughs> um, and I just let it be there. And within about 30 seconds, it stopped bleeding. And I could walk it off. And it was fine. It was a huge gouge. The pain went away. And I know from my past experience, I know what my body's like, that was a limping injury for days at least. Not being able to wear socks, etc. But all I did is accepted it, and it went away. You can do that with anything. And that is one of the secrets of people who beat cancer and people who beat strokes and quadriplegia and all that sort of stuff. People that get into car accidents and break their neck and get told they're never going to move again, they just surrender to it. I've got a broken neck and my arms aren't moving. Okay, I'll just let it be. And then from that state of mind, some new things start popping up. What can I do? Start entering a new frame of mind, and it's this problem-solving state of mind. But you'll never enter the problem-solving state of mind when you're denying that it's not there. So just allowing things to be unconditionally. And this goes for relationships as well. So not swearing at the guy that cuts you off. That's just his karmic pattern. Let him be a jerk on the road. You don't have to get mad at it. Whatever. Just accept it. Unconditional love. He, he cut me off, big deal. I can put my foot on the brake, I'm going to get to the place where I'm trying to go 10 seconds later. Big deal. Even if I get there half an hour later, big deal, is the world going to fall apart? No. He's a jerk, it doesn't affect me. Unconditional love. Right. That's not an easy thing to get. And if you commit to that, if you say, alright, I'm going to be unconditionally loving and kind and gentle with everyone I meet, no matter what, guess what happens? You start to get scenarios that are unlovable. And you can't be kind to that person or that thing because it's unlovable. Right? <laughs> That's what happens. You getting that as well? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's what's up. So I've gone through a divorce and it's been a very horrible divorce. I had seen my daughter for 12 months, so things were very, very bitter. Mm-hmm. Um, and my ex is still me using my daughter as a mediator between the two of us. And that, that's the thing. I have that anger built up inside of me because it's like he's using her to hurt me. And I don't like him hurting her to hurt me, but yeah, it's getting around it. And that's why you say, yeah, things like that in relationships and things like that. Even with old relationships, yeah, I can associate with it quite well. Okay. And we've all got this stuff going on at some level, whether it's at that level. Yeah. That's a pretty high level. It is. Of- Trying to be unconditional. Yeah. yeah. Other people have got it in a smaller way, like the guy cutting you off or whatever it is. But the degree that you're getting it is the degree to which the universe or consciousness is challenging you. So if you're committed to being unconditionally loving, truly, you're going to get it extreme. So that's your test. And if you pass that test, you get up level to the max and you get to experience more happiness, more fulfillment, more joy, more peace, more love, etc. If you fail that test, you keep getting it again and again. Yeah. <laughs> It's your choice. Yeah, that's it. He can be that way if he wants. It doesn't have to affect you. Yeah. It is up to you. I mean, Alright, so, I'm sure everyone here has something that sticks out in their mind that's not quite right in their health and wellness right now. There's going to be something. It might be a little, it might be huge. It might be that you need to lose 20 kilos. It might be that you're a little bit angry and you have to get rid of that. It might be that your vision isn't great. It could be something little, it could be something big. Identify that thing right now. Take the next 10 seconds, shut your eyes, and just ask yourself, what one thing, if I changed, would have the biggest effect on my overall wellness? 
What one thing? Alright, has everyone got something? You don't have to share it. Just lock it away. The next question, if it's truly that main thing, you might want to sort of refine it a little bit. If that's truly the thing, you can ask yourself now, how would I do that? How would I change that thing? And let's say it is losing 20 kilos or something like that. The first response might be to exercise and to improve my diet. Okay, good. So now what? Can you do that right now? Probably not. You're in this room. Can you do it after we leave? Maybe. Is it something you can start literally doing today or within the next 24 hours? The reason I ask that, because if it's not something you can move on in the next 12 to 24 hours, you're not going to do it. So if you've just identified that you've got anger, that's the thing that's holding you back because you're tense in the neck and that's, it's, it's coming from anger because you hate your job or something, right? Your boss is a jerk and you've got a tense neck, so you want to get rid of that. Can you do something in the next 12 or 24 hours to start releasing that anger? Or is it something you're just going to put on the back burner and I'll get to it next week or next month or when I'm 45 I'm getting heart problems? So if you can move on it in the next 12 to 24 hours, if you can literally write down, at 8am tomorrow I will, da -da -da -da, then it will get done. If not, it's probably not going to happen. And link it to your values, like I said. Link it to what's really important to you. So if that anger at the moment isn't linked to those things that are really important to you, it'll just become less and less important as the days, weeks, months go on, and you'll stay the same way as well. But that's a really powerful question. What one thing, if I was to change it today, if I had the power to go like this, what would make me the highest in one of starting today? And from that, you can start asking questions that actually mobilise that. But if you don't ask a question, it'll never happen. So ask a question. I just want to talk about pain and symptoms for a moment here, because people get a little bit confused about pain and symptoms. And it's probably because we've been a little bit indoctrinated by media, um, by TV, by newspapers and magazines and stuff like that. We get told, um, if you've got nerve pain, that's a new one, ask your doctor about nerve pain, here's what we can do about it. You will use this drug or this surgery to get rid of the pain. So, and that's been going on for years, generally uh, fueled by drug companies and Western uh, medicine. I'm not bagging Western medicine, it's got some fantastic stuff, we need Western medicine, but by and large, the drug companies, um, their marketing is to sell you whatever they can to block something. Because everyone wants to feel good now. We can, you can feel good now and take Panadol. And you can keep playing tennis and take Voltaren, right? That sort of stuff. So what they're trying to do, they've convinced you that pain is bad, symptoms are bad. But what is pain? Why do we have pain? Is it a mistake? Did we, did we evolve and like evolution got it wrong? Yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a warning system, yeah? yeah? Exactly, it's exactly what it is. It's a signal from the body saying, excuse me, something right here is not right. And the degree of pain is generally to match the degree of issue. So severe pain is a severe problem right here, generally. So it's not to be angry at pain or to deny pain or to push it away. It's to say thank you. You've just alerted me to something I've been ignoring or I haven't loved yet. So that's what pain is. It's telling you something's going on here. So to use my very simple heel example before, you go, well, how's that a signal? You just knock something. Well, I took it and I interpreted it this way, I'm not from a heel, I took it as just an example in myself and a chance to practice surrender. Fantastic. I needed it. Because I've been reading all about this stuff and going, all right, so prove it to me that this stuff actually works. So I knocked me, we'll cut it open, and I had a chance to practice it. <laughs> I've been waiting for it. And then shortly after that, I got a cold sore. I thought, here we go. They get massive on me. Here we go, another cold sore. Um, and at the time, I was studying EFT. Does anyone know what EFT is? Yeah, you do, Josie? EFT is a fantastic technique. It's also called tapping. It uses different points on the face yes. to tap. You heard of it? Yeah. It uses acupuncture points called BNE points to tap while talking and clearing out emotional issues linked with physical things. Not just emotional things, but in this case, physical things. And doing that, you can relieve pain in seconds, minutes, sometimes days, but depending on the severity of it. It's a body-mind technique, fantastic technique. So I got the cold sore, and I got angry at it, 
it's itchy and I thought, here we go, it's going to be huge, it's going to ruin this. I've got photos coming up and we had a photo shoot coming up and stuff like that for our engagement. Um, so I was like, shit, I got pissed off at it. I thought, hang a sec, I've got EFT, let's do this. Finally, I can try it on something physical. So I tapped on it. I kid you not, within hours, it was gone. And that has never been my pattern before. It starts to tingle more, you start to see it get bigger, it starts to swell, it's itchy, I can't stand it, I'm trying to do stuff to it. It went, it went away. All I did was said, thank you for my healing. And tap, tap, tap. That's just one technique. There's many, many techniques you can use, but EFT is one of the bigger ones these days. There's lots of stuff out there about it. If you're interested in a very simple little technique, just Google EFT. Nick Ortner is the main guy that's doing it right now. He's very good. So that's a fantastic technique to get rid of anger to get rid of pain, to block limiting beliefs, to help you get into the gym, whatever it is, it's fantastic. So that's, that was my pain or symptom, that was a blessing because it taught me something about myself and it helped me at that point in time. So it's interpretation of it. Pain is not bad, pain is a signal from the body to get you mobilised to do something because you're ignoring something important or you just need the lesson. But it's up to you whether you take that signal as a lesson, or if you deny it, get angry at it. The other interesting thing about pain is pain is part of physical existence. We are flesh and blood, we're dust to dust and that kind of thing. We are physical bodies, biological organisms. So pain is naturally part of our existence and I think it's unwise to think we're never going to have pain again unless you get to a certain sort of spiritual level perhaps some call it enlightenment, then pain literally goes away. But until that point, which is reached by a really tiny amount of the population, for the majority of people, pain is reality of the physical body. What is not inherent in the human existence is suffering. Suffering is the interpretation of pain is bad. That's what suffering is. So most people are walking around suffering. Everyone's walking around in pain, but you don't have to be walking around in suffering. That's the choice. And that's the the separation between the two. We all have to experience pain in life. It's part of human life. But you don't have to experience suffering. Again, that's the label you place on it. And you, feel about it. you can surrender to it. You can let it go. You can do EFT. You can do a myriad of different things, but you don't have to suffer. And a really good question to ask yourself when you're getting pain or suffering is, let's say, let, let's use not acute pain, something that's just happened. Let's say something has been there for a week. You go, all right, why would that be there? Have I got the lesson? Okay, I can't find the lesson. What's causing this pain? Would I consciously choose this pain? Would you sit there and say, okay, I'm going to have pain in my hip for a week? Yeah. So who's, who's doing it then? Who's choosing it? Subconscious. Subconscious. So it's now been relegated to behind you, the subconscious mind. If you can bring it forward into the conscious mind, you can then get rid of it. But as long as it's the subconscious is controlling it, it'll remain for a long time. So your job is to bring it forward, recognize it, not deny it, and just let it go. But as long as it's subconscious, it's going to stay there. So if you ask yourself, would I consciously choose to be in this situation right now? Would I consciously choose to be angry? No, oh, angry, angry, anger doesn't feel good. Resentment doesn't feel good. Guilt doesn't feel good. Shame doesn't feel good. So who's choosing that? Not you. Your old patterns are choosing that. So bring it forward. Analyze what it's all about and let it go. Find the blessing in it and let it go. Alright. I've been talking enough. Has anyone got any questions on anything we've touched on or anything we haven't touched on? Um, I think I've got an article that you wrote about um, the, the child that was being had What's the ADHD? ADHD? Yeah. I think that'd be really important. Okay. Yeah. Is that a good example? Okay. Um, ADHD. Everyone know what ADHD is attention deficit hyperactive disorder. So it's it's kids mostly, but also adults that are hyperactive and they can't focus on stuff. Their attention deficit. They can't have their attention on one thing. And um, it's basically diagnosed as a neurochemical imbalance that they've got way too much of. Um, the excitatory stuff and not enough of the, the brake pedal, essentially. They've got too much glutamate, not enough GABA, to use technical terms. Too much accelerator, not enough brake. That's true. They do. We can test it. It shows up clinically. And we do that in the clinic. But 
the illusion comes in now when they define it as something that is from the genes, for example. And yes, you might have a genetic propensity for ADHD, but it's not just the genes. So what I've found, in my experience, is that the vast majority of children and adults that have ADHD, or just ADD, they're not attention deficit, totally. They are attention deficit, but not completely. They've got an area somewhere in their lives where they have an attention surplus, a huge attention surplus to one thing. With kids, it's generally art, dance, drama, video games. They're the main ones. Facebook. Stuff like that, right, with our generation these days. We're kind of just apps, phones. So they don't have an attention deficit because they can sit on their smartphone or their iPad or their Xbox or they can dance or do drama or music or whatever their thing is for hours on there. No one has to get them up in the morning to do it. No one has to motivate them to do it. They are inspired from within to go and do that thing. So they don't have an attention deficit. They've got an attention surplus in a really tightly honed area. They just, to, to the, they just don't like anything else, essentially. So, if you can ask that child or that person, what would, let's say it's a kid, because that's the most common example, and they're struggling at school, and they're failing English, and they're failing maths and stuff like that, because all they love is, uh, let's use the drama example, all they love is drama, they're failing everything else, or doing quite poorly at it, and they're labelled as ADHD, because they're jittery in class, and they're hyperactive. Because um, they just want to be doing drama. If you can now get them, if you can ask them and get them to link in their minds how English and maths is related to drama, they'll now be inspired to go and do English or go and do maths. For example, I had this young child in recent what I wrote that article about. She was on the when she walked in. She's just like apathetic, didn't care. And then you say, what year are you going to this year? What subjects are you doing? Maths and English. And what's your favourite thing? Drama. So it perk up a bit. It's like, okay. And she'd just been labelled ADD. So I said to her, all right, her dad was there. And he knew. He was. He just didn't know how to communicate it to her. So I said, do you mind? And he's like, yeah, let's do this. And I said, all right, so what's your worst, most hated lesson? And she said, mm, English? Shit. This is gay. <laughs> <laughs> English is gay. What's your favourite lesson? Drama. All right, drama. What language do you speak when you're acting? I don't know. <laughs> what language do you speak when you're acting? Looks at her dad and dad's like, <laughs> English, I suppose. Uh, okay. Is it not important? Would it not benefit you if you had a really good grasp of English? You would be the best at drama because you could enunciate and you could put together sentences more beautifully and more articulately than anyone else in that class. And you would be a star at drama and it would benefit you greatly. Can you see that? No. <laughs> All right. We didn't have time in that particular consult, but I said to the dad, I said, what you've got to do is you've got to show her how all of the lessons she hates are linked to what she loves. And drama is, and it should be an easy one with English, but she wasn't getting it. And that's the thing. They deny it. I don't want to see it. They're so attention focused on one thing. They literally can't even conceptualize how English is related to speaking on stage. That's how far gone they are because they're so tightly home. So it takes a bit of effort. But you can absolutely cure kids with ADHD, without drugs, just by getting them to realise that everything in life is linked to everything else. Everything is linkable. Nothing is exempt. Challenge you to try that yourself in something you hate doing that you know you should be doing. Exercise, again, is another common one. Let's say you're not. <laughs> do it. You do it tonight. Work out when you're kind of doing the dishes. How is this linked to whatever it is that you love? And if you think about it, do the same thing with the dishes. Find the hardest thing, find the worst thing that you really just resent doing and link it. Link to what it is that you love. And if you try, if you actually do this exercise, you find the links. But you can stack up the links. Because if you only do one, you'll see it momentarily and then fade away. You get to stack those links up until all you see when you see dishes and cooking and ironing is whatever it is that you love. Same with this kid. If she took the process to the end, and linked everything to drama, she'd love English. She'd be inspired to do English because she knows it's going to help her with drama. She can't wait to go do it. And maths, she can't wait to do maths. It's going to help me with this and that and it's all that drama. That's all she's done. I'm inspired to rest. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried that with my son. He's only 10. But he's handling it with bad, like, shot him in the bad. Um, and he's like, he loves maths. He loves maths, loves science. 
And so we we'll we'll tried to say, well, you've got to get your handwriting right because what's the point of being really good at maths and doing all your answers if no one can read your answers? You're going to get marked wrong. That doesn't work. Just keep stacking them up. Find that thing that really just makes them go, ah, oh, ah, oh, ah. Oh. Yeah. I'll make the rubbish work out too. Yeah, punishment does work. Yeah. Just keep stacking up those links until he goes, ah. Oh. But he's only 10, so I don't know. He's old enough. Yeah. To see the things, you just keep speaking his language, which at this time is maths and science. Use that kind of language to link it to the other stuff, because you just communicate with his values. Yeah. yeah, he's got absolutely got the intelligence to see the links. Don't say, oh, he's ten, he won't get it to fifteen. Absolutely, by ten. Yeah. By the age of six, you can absolutely reason with kids. Before that, it's a little bit more challenging. You can do kind of tricks and stuff like that. But reason, that part of the brain is almost fully developed. To the level that we require. Yeah. So that's what he punished her. <laughs> <laughs> she can't see that she. Yeah. Um, Alright, well, that's it. Be gone. Start using the technique. I'll give you some really simple things, some really challenging ones as well. Um, the easiest by far is just letting things go. I'm not denying it, but saying, yep, there it is. Am I willing to let this go? Yes. Say yes. Say yes. Everything. <laughs> and you love everything. <laughs> Nothing can piss you off if you love everything and everyone. <laughs> Well, if my ex was to turn around and say I love you, he'd probably fall over. It might work though. I'm still on the radio. Yeah, it might do. It's a shock. Yeah. Any final questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank